You can say NARAP or NARAP, but, but it's the National Association, the National Association of Hispanic Realtors. And I'll tell you what, I'm born and raised here in the cities, and this is one of the most impressive groups, organizations that I've seen here. I really mean it. This is a group, uh, a lot of millennials, but you know, they're aggressive. They're all in the same industry and still competitive, but still working together. And they're on every political uh, board, I would say, uh, that has to do with housing. Now that's progressive, they're, they're right on the move. And I think in their first year, they were, they were rookie of the year of the national chat. How about a hand for now, Rep? Now, now this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, if you can imagine, they're taking this whole building, which consists of 36 rooms, they're taking the soccer, the ball field, and they're doing this whole thing, and they're putting on a Twin Cities housing, diverse housing event, correct, Isaac? And it's going to be uh, um, one of the, I think, one of the most exciting events uh, we've had in the cities. Uh, African American, uh, our Asian friends, and the Latinos. It's all happening here. Am I going to get any points off? Is there 10 points for me doing something <laughs> as I'm talking about? It? The points are in the bank. All right. So here's where we're going to start our morning presentation, and, and we, we think it's the right way to do it. Isaac was a presenter last time on behalf of NAREP, and we were talking about multicultural uh, marketing and cultural marketing efforts in housing. Uh, in, in, in particular, uh, talking about the fact that if you're Latino, you can go and sell to any segment. You know, it doesn't have to be just the Latino segment, because we, we all want our agents to grow. So you can sell to the Asian community, you can sell to the general market, but you, there's nuances there. There's understanding the culture. Isaac did a, a first class presentation, but I'm bringing him back because he mentioned during his remarks how important the digi digital marketing is in the industry. Now, Alex Vargas, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. And, uh, yeah. and so what we like to do, uh, we're gonna have Isaac as our, and he's gonna follow up on presenting a digital case study of what he's doing now with his business. And uh, so let's have a hand for Isaac Contreras. Thank you so much. How about a hand for Rick? He always puts on a, a great presentation. He always gets class, uh, first class presenters. And so I'm always honored to be able to uh, speak, speak amongst uh, uh, first high quality professionals and be able to present some of my thoughts, some of the things that I found over the years um, in my experience. And so thanks again, Rick, appreciate that. And then I do appreciate you bringing up the, the NAREP thing and the, uh, uh, the housing fair that we're having this weekend. It's, it's incredible because it's the first of its kind collaboration between the affinity groups to be able to take it over. So here in Minnesota, it is fantastic. I love it. Um, so one of the things that I wanna talk about, <clears throat> June is National Home Ownership Month. So this is an appropriate topic. Not that I don't like talking about real estate, right? <laughs> okay. um, but uh, um, in regards to uh, digital marketing and the Hispanic home buyer, some of the things that I brought up at the last presentation was to identify some of the questions that you as a marketer would want to answer to be able to penetrate and gain market share within the, the three different groups that I identified, the Hispanic home, uh, homeowner, home buyer, the uh, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander group, and then the Black American group as well. And so we kind of evolved into this digital marketing question, right? So before, um, <clears throat> for, for most of us, um, and for some of us, digital marketing can mean you know, one of two things, or it can go across an entire spectrum of, that includes you know, uh, a text marketing, email marketing, it could include uh, tracking pixels, not just social media stuff, right? I mean, it's a, it, can, it can be very uh, uh, expansive. It's an expansive universe, right? And can hit so many different pieces. But one of the things is, is when, you're, when you're talking about digital marketing, some of us 
are able to go back and have a division that is just waiting for us to give them direction and tasks um, because of the information that they're picking up from this type of uh, venue, this type of a conference. The others, everything is on our shoulders. Like if, if we're not creating it, if we're not maintaining it, if we're not engaging in it, then it just doesn't get done. So I kind of want to sit and, and spend some time in, in, the, in, the, in the digital marketing universe. I want to spend some time in the space of social media and uh, real estate and specifically the Hispanic home buyer and some of the tools to use and some of the things to look for when you're trying to get this message out or even what message to get out, right? And so I want to kind of set a couple of things and I want to see if we can agree on a few items. One of them, can we agree that this is us? Not necessarily that we are all out there taking selfies, right? But that this is about as far away as we let our phone get in any 24 hour period, right? This is about as far away as we let our phone get and so it's there with us at work. It's definitely there with us when we're watching TV. It's there with, with us when we're, uh, when we're eating, right? And so if we can agree that this is us and that's about as far as we let our phone get, it, with the exception of maybe when you take a shower, right? <laughs> and even then you probably connect to Bluetooth <laughs> to make sure that you can get entertained. Mine is waterproof. Yours, see, <laughs> right there, he brings it with him. He doesn't let it go. And, and, and to speak on that, the, the phone case industry is like a $24 billion industry, right? So shower's not the last place it's going to. <laughs> and it's funny, and I bring that up because a couple weeks ago I was at a home goods or something like that, a home decoration store. And I was looking at this decoration that is very much appropriate for the bathroom. And it's a nice little framed photo that you put up on the bathroom, in the bathroom, and it says, this is a bathroom, not an internet cafe, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think we can all agree that this is about as far away as we let our phones get, okay? The other thing is, is that I think we can agree that this is where our attention is at, okay? Our attention is in this phone. Wherever it is that we're going, like I said, whether we're eating, whether we're watching TV, and if, and if we happen to be watching TV with commercials, that phone comes right out during a commercial. When was the last time you watched a commercial? The Super Bowl, right? Maybe you watched the commercial when the phone fell off the arm of the couch when you were watching Blue Bloods or Rosa de Guadalupe, right? So we can, I think we can agree that this is where our attention is at. And in speaking about real estate and being a real estate agent, this is important to understand. And it's important to understand because typically when you're a new agent or when you're an agent trying to cross cultures, right, you think you fit into one segment, this is, this is where I feel good, and maybe my business has gotten to a point where I need to make adjustments to different segments of demographics that I want to tap into. This is our signage. Our phone is our billboard, okay? It's our radio ad. Thank it's you. our bus Thank ad. <laughs> it's our print ad. It's our direct mail. It's our bus stop sign, okay? This is where our attention is at. And, 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 and you can see that, heck, you can see that driving on the highway. You can see that driving on the highway. You're driving on the highway and you look over and there's a car full of people and four out of five people, what are they doing? They're not looking at the billboard, they're looking at their phone. And unfortunately, too often, five out of five people are looking at their phone on the highway, right? So if we understand this, when you're, in, in, when you're a real estate agent, when you're just starting out, maybe when the budget is close to zero, that this is our signage. This is not to say that these other traditional mediums are not important. They're critical, okay? They need to be part of an overall strategy 
especially for growth. However, when you're looking at, like I said, this small segment of the universe that has almost no dollars in it as far as a budget, so when we talk about digital spend, there's a starting point. You can get attention. You can get and reach an audience using digital marketing, specifically across social media and, uh, um, and, and the different uh, uh, platforms. The, the importance of knowing that, because you're able to reach such a vast, or a vast audience across <laughs> the different social media platforms using your phone, if you're, if you're willing to experiment, if you're willing to stay consistent and put the hard work in, okay, if you're willing to make adjustments and re realize some feedbacks, so realize some feedback that'll be coming back at you based on what it is that you put out there. The idea being that if you, if you stay consistent with it, you get a conversion timeline for that prospect within your sphere of influence, right? I'm touching folks, I have an audience. If you're putting that information out there, you're using that as your billboard sign, your bus stop sign, your radio ad, things like that, you can collapse this time frame of conversion from someone who's in your sphere of influence, collapse that, that part of the time frame of should I call Isaac when it comes to buying or selling a home. Collapse that time frame, and the quicker that you collapse that time frame, Using the, using the phone, using these, built, these digital marketing from should I call Isaac into I gotta call Isaac when you're thinking about buying or selling a home, when you can collapse that time frame, the quicker, the quicker your business will grow and the faster you're gonna find success. Because you're also able to, within this digital marketing on, on, this, on the platform like Facebook and TikTok and Snapchat, things like that, you're able to have influence on their circle of, uh, or their sphere of influence. So if I'm reaching out to Angela and I'm in her sphere of influence, when she goes to work, when she goes to church, <coughs> when she goes to the family get together, if I've done my job and someone brings up home buying, buying a home, selling a home, anything like that, if I can collapse that, should I tell them about Isaac? to I got to tell them about Isaac. That's the power behind understanding that this is where our attention is at and that we don't let it outside of a like five, uh, three and a half foot radius foot, right? That's as far as it goes. So if you can understand that, as, especially as a new real estate agent or a real estate agent that's crossing different markets and trying to dive into different segments, that this is the tool. This is a delivery system for that message. And I think we can all agree how powerful that, that is. Now, I bring up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the social media platforms. Um, I'm just bringing up these ones. There's many more out there, but Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, we're all familiar with them. They're very, you know, they're household names now, right? And the idea behind this is, the, the thing that I want you to understand about this is that when you create a piece of content on one platform, it does not necessarily have a place on the other platforms in the form that it is. So if you're creating a post on Facebook and expect it to have the same kind of results on TikTok or Instagram or LinkedIn, and you're scratching your head wondering why, you gotta understand that the nature of the platforms are all different. They all have their different behaviors. They all have their different desires, okay? People go to different platforms for different reasons. No different than you don't go to Chick-fil-A to order a Big Mac. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna eat, it's still something that I wanna do, but I know that I'm not gonna go to Chick-fil-A for something that's gonna be found at the, uh, McDonald's. Same thing here. So take the time to make adjustments. You can take the same kind of content, right? Create a post for Facebook, 
and then make adjustments for it to be more photo friendly, photogenic for Instagram because folks go there to see pictures of the content and then make it adjustments or even create a short form reel for TikTok because folks go there for that type of uh, engagement, that type of entertainment. And maybe it doesn't even have a place on LinkedIn because that's a different platform, a different nature. And so be mindful of that because if you, if you put a Facebook post on a LinkedIn, you're not, you probably will not get the same kind of results that you're looking for. You might even find yourself getting pushback because folks on LinkedIn are very protective of their LinkedIn posts maintaining levels of professionalism and business nature. It's very, they're very protective. And that's just kind of how it is. Now, with the ex now, what I will say is that here in the last few years, short form reels that you find on like TikTok and that you find on, uh, 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 um, on Instagram, those reels have had a lot of traction and have, a lot, have had a lot of success in being flexible enough to move across different platforms. And what I mean by that is you can create a reel on TikTok, put it into, re, re, repurpose it for Facebook, link it to your Instagram account, and then, it'll, and then throw it onto YouTube Shorts. And it can be the same video. And so if you're looking at having an impact, if you're looking at uh, 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 exploring the short form reels type of content, the chances of you finding success and being able to use that same post all, all, through all these different platforms is higher than you would if it was just a picture of that post, trying to do it across all the four, four platforms. So just be mindful of that. There's other platforms that are, that are gaining uh, uh, traction amongst the demographics that you're looking for. TikTok, you'd be surprised. And a lot of us are probably saying, I'll, I'll never be on TikTok. But we probably said that about Facebook too, <laughs> right? And so the fastest growing segment in TikTok is actually folks that are 40 years and older. So be mindful of that. Don't, don't dismiss it. Because if you can get good at TikTok, Whatever that next platform comes, you'll be good at that too. You'll already have an edge. So be mindful of that. These are all useful tools when you're trying to get into you or when you're looking for a vehicle to deliver that message that you're trying to uh, uh, send out there. Um, let's see here. Oh, another reason that I wanted to touch base on these platforms here is because it's important to engage. I recommend that you engage, engage, engage. Now, this is an opportunity within the, to, when you're engaging on these platforms, especially as we're coming out of COVID and we're kind of readjusting to the new normal, trying to figure that out. I, I, I think we're at the end of the interim normal and we're coming into the new normal. Um, as, you're, as you're doing this, this is your opportunity to use these platforms to network. Network with your folks in a business platform, in a Facebook group, when you're following a group on LinkedIn. These are all opportunities to network digitally, right? Engage, use these opportunities to have your, your where you would have normally had a coffee meet, okay? Use these opportunities where you might have bumped into somebody at the grocery store in the produce aisle. These are opportunities to do that. Reach out and engage. Because what happens is if, if all you're doing is push marketing, if all you're doing is just pushing, pushing, pushing your marketing, your audience is going to have social media fatigue. Like that's a real thing. So manage how much you're pushing and don't be afraid to engage. No different than when you're seeing somebody, like I said, you bump into them at the grocery aisle are at the grocery store in the produce aisle. This is that type of opportunity. This is type, that type of atmosphere that you can do this in. So engage. Make it about them. Take a look at them. See what it is that interests them. And ask them about it. 
you get to have an opportunity to be, to be hyper local when you're engaging your audience and you get to know about them. Now, um, the other thing is, I want to, I want to kind of, I'm going to get a little bit on the soapbox here, right? Make it about them. And the reason I say that is because I'm in the real estate industry. We've had record sales. We've had record number of agents coming into the industry, right? And so when it comes to real estate, you see plenty of closing pictures, right? And that's a great thing to celebrate. A closing day, that is a huge accomplishment. That is a big thing to celebrate. But when you're taking the pictures, I often wonder, who bought the house, right? I love seeing closing day pictures, but too often I see the agent stuck in between the couple, and I wonder, who bought the house? Mm -hmm. I say this because I want you to realize your position in that messaging, okay? Who is the message about? Are you engaging your folks, or are you just interrupting them? If you're engaging, that's a back and forth. If you're just pushing, and it's all about you, people nowadays realize that. They see it, they feel it, they sense it, okay? So I'm gonna get off my soapbox on that one, just kinda make adjustments there. I, I recommend that you make adjustments, that's all. So you do the picture on the left, is that what you're supporting? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm not gonna lie, I was guilty of that. When I first started, I was guilty of that. I'd find myself making sure that I was inside of it. And then it dawned on me, I was like, wait a second, I didn't buy this house. And I stepped back and then we made adjustments and now this is the type of picture that goes up and now we talk about them and celebrate them. And because of that, it changes the, it changes the demeanor in which they realize that they were up, they were, the transaction was about them because this is very much a relationship, a relationship transaction. It can be about opening a door, right? And for some, that's all it is, is just opening a door and showing up at closing day and collecting a check. But the other ones, the ones that you're going to see, the 80-20, right? 20% 20 of the agents are doing 80% of all the business. That 20%, they're making it a, rela a relationship, okay? And they'll get those calls back, okay? So I'm going to get off my soapbox a little bit here on that one. Um, and I want to talk about um, um, some of the information as far as why marketing to the uh, Latino home buyer is critical to uh, growth strategy. So there's a few, few pieces uh, of information here that I think are phenomenally important. One, for the last seven years, nationally, the Latino com uh, community has continued to show home ownership growth for seven straight years. And we are now nationally at 48.4%, okay? That has continued to grow even through the pandemic, okay, and that's a big deal. And it's predicted and it's forecasted that by 2025, we're gonna be at 50%. So when you hear about the home ownership gap, we are as a cohort doing a lot, despite all the obstacles to be able to close that gap, okay? Here in Minnesota, which is important to us here, what's our local market doing, okay? We're almost at 50%. And this 49.5% that we're seeing in home ownership growth, uh, in home ownership rate in the Twin Cities or in the Minnesota market, that's a 62.3% growth rate since 2010. So it's just been skyrocketing. And it makes us the number one home ownership growth rate market in the entire Midwest region. Which, is tr which, which for me is a big deal because, I mean, we're talking, we're competing against Chicagoland, right? And we're able to see this type of growth. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's, there's opportunity for employment here. We're getting paid more around here in, the, in Minnesota, okay? We like the school systems generally, right? <laughs> right? We're not crazy about the taxes, but we're willing to pay them because our streets are actually, uh, 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 don't have potholes and they're, and they're plowed, right? So um, that's another thing. But, uh, um, but this, these, these, these successes, they weren't easy, okay? 
they have not been easy to achieve. But we did it even though we have uh, obstacles in front of us in regards to access to credit, in regards to housing inventory, and even our immigration policies have made it difficult for us. You've seen different items come up in, the, in politically as far as immigration items, uh, policies coming up that have blocked home ownership for the Latino community, but have also opened it back up. And not, and not only that, but on the immigration piece, we're having trouble across the nation finding people who swing hammers, okay? And the Latino community is, has an overrepresentation in the construction community. And we're good at it. Yeah. And we're proud of that. And we build businesses around that. But it also, the immigration policies hold some of that back because if there was some adjustments there, we would be able to fill that labor force gap that's there, okay? So it has not been easy, but even, you know, in spite of those obstacles, we are seeing that positive growth and it's not stopping, okay? Some of these other stats and trends that I want to kind of keep in front of you, okay? I always point this out, and the reason why I always point this out is because on the first stat there, of the Latino population in the U.S., 62.8% of it are U.S. born, okay? When I say that out loud, if you've been, if, if you open up the T, or if you open up the newspaper, if you read the newspaper, you read blogs online, if you're watching TV, watch the news for more than five minutes, right? The message that you're getting from there doesn't match up with this number here. Because it always feels like, whenever we're listening to the, the news or we're reading the news, it always feels like the Latino population in the United States is a perpetual foreigner, okay? The reality is, is that 62.8% of us are actually born here in the United States. That changes things when you're talking about credit. That changes things when you're talking about loan products. That changes things when you're talking about that ability to the, the obstacles that are in the path are that are in your path to home ownership. Okay. Ninety-three percent of all Latinos in the United States are actually born in the United States. So make sure that when you're when you're thinking about who you're going to target, who you're going to go after, that you recognize that we all don't fit under just one platform. Heck, there's there's a twenty plus countries in, that are identified in Latin America. You're not going to get it right. I mean, within each country, you have the different dialects. I mean, I'm, I'm from here, born and raised. I was, I lived up there. <laughs> and my, I get in trouble with, uh, I used to get in trouble with my family, with my mom used to be worried about me because I learned how to speak Spanish from my dad. And my dad in Mexico is from Yucatan. And they talk a certain way that is not well received by the folks in Mexico City, right? And so you have that. So it's, it's very hard, um, but you can achieve understanding and you can use it using social media, okay? So understand this, make sure that when you're making uh, adjustments and you're looking, uh, that you understand that 62.8%, and that's growing, right, 62.8%, that's growing is U.S. born. The other part is the, US, uh, the labor force participation rate is 65.5%. That is the highest labor force participation rate than any demographic, okay? And for the last 10 years has been 80% of all labor force growth, labor force particip participation rate growth for the last 10 years. The Latino community works and we work hard, yeah. okay? So keep that in mind. And as a result, because we're here and we're working, Latino adults aged 45 and under, 40.8% of them are mortgage ready. That is eight million, over eight million pieces of business when you talk about being mortgage ready. Folks that are, uh, have sufficient FICO scores, folks that have sufficient income ratios, folks that have not had any severe delinquencies in the last year, that's what makes you mortgage ready amongst a couple of other uh, pieces of criteria. 
but Latino adults aged 45 and under were mortgage ready. That's just a portion, okay? 40.8%, that's over 8.3 million pieces of business that are ready to be conducted, okay? And so as a result, Urban Institute has forecast that for the next 20 years, all new home ownership growth will come from the Latino community at a rate of 70%, okay? So I'm gonna say that again, 70% of all new home ownership growth will come from the Latino community for the next 20 years. And that's a big number. That's a huge trend. What if they're wrong? What if it's 60%, all right? Or maybe it's 15 years. You can still build a business model around that. That's an entire career. So take this into account when you're looking at who am I talking to? What is the potential there? What is the opportunity? Okay, because it's showing right there, there's a lot of business to be done, and it's showing right there the buying power of the Latino community in the United States. When they look at, uh, most recently, the Census Bureau said that the Latino economic buying power, the GDP of the U.S. Latino, is the seventh largest economy in the world. The seventh largest, that's on par with France. I mean, right now we've got Russia, which is number 11, fighting a war, right? That's how big we are here in the United States. Seventh largest economy in the world, okay? So what do I do? I got this information, what, it is, what is it that I do, okay? I believe that if you answer this question, how do I do this, that you'll be able to ca capture market share? And so for the Hispanic home buyer, the question I think is more along the lines of, how do I do this? More along the lines of understanding what levers do I, as a Hispanic home buyer, prospective home buyer, what levers do I pull in order to put me on the path to leadership, or to home ownership, okay? I think if in your marketing, when you're engaging your folks, when you're engaging the, uh, uh, the demographic, that if you can answer this question within your, within your messaging, what levers can I pull? How do I do this? How do I buy a home? Not necessarily whether or not I want to because we've already shown the commitment to home ownership. We've already shown that uh, uh, there's not gonna be much that stands in the way of us buying a home, right? But how do I do this? What are the levers that I can pull? What are the programs that I can pull? So I want you to understand a few things too in the market. The market has been hostile to first time home buyers, okay? When you look at this graph here, what I want, I want you to see is that for the last 10 years, for the last 10 years, 70 to 75 percent of all new home purchases have been conventional loans, okay? That's been the, 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 the largest segment of how the financing is happening, right? For the Latino buyer, we are twice as likely to use an FHA loan, a government-backed loan, to be able to buy a house. So we are already at a disadvantage. And when NAREP, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, conducted a survey of their top 620 agents, 85% of their agents said their FHA buyers were at a disadvantage against conventional loans. And then 44% of those agents, the top producers, worked to switch their clients from an FHA loan to a conventional loan so that they can be competitive, right? And it also doesn't help that FHA has a 90-day flipping rule which means if a house has been flipped that it has to be owned at least 90 days before you can make an offer on it if you're an FHA buyer, okay? So Isaac, yes. what do you guys do when you have real estate agents that um, when they have a client um, and the loan officer basically is, is pigeonholing them into an FHA product, mm -hmm. even when they have great credit scores, what is the pushback back to that loan officer for your client to be able to start asking the questions to give them that power to be able to come back and say, well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. 
know, why are you just pre-qualifying me for an FHA product? I have 780 credit scores. And what are the conventional products? What are the, you know, what are the portfolio of conventional products? There's no mortgage insurance. Absolutely. What other products do you offer and how are your agents educating those clients to be able to go back and push back mm -hmm. so they can get pre-qualified for more conventional loans and flip that number to 85% mm -hmm. conventional and 44% FHA? And, then, and I'm glad you asked that question because that's exactly once you understand that, that this is what is happening. When you're marketing, when you're messaging out to the folks, if you can demonstrate that you have the strategies, not to just open a door, but that you have the strategies and tactics among them, how do we make a, an adjustment from an FHA product, which I know has been a disadvantage for my clients? How do we make that switch over to, can we make that switch over? So yes, it's all in the messaging. You can go hyper-local with that. You direct, you engage. You use the platforms for that. A couple things to keep in mind about the Hispanic home buyer. Okay, one, we tend to have a collective mindset. Okay, what I mean by that is when we're looking at a property, we're not looking at buying a property just me by myself for the most part. <clears throat> I'm going to have my wife, or I'm going to have my spouse, and I'm probably also going to have two other, two or three other people helping make that payment as well. So it's a collective mindset because if we are going, if, if we're going to go, we're all going, okay? We want to know when we're looking at a house, where is everybody going to park for the birthday parties, okay? We want to know when we're looking at a house, where's my madrina going to sit when she's watching her novella, right? right? Things like that. These are things that are very important to us because that leads into family. We want to, we're looking for houses that are at least three bedrooms, if not more, okay? And we want finished basements. And we want finished basements because I'm probably going to have my abuelita coming with, or I might have my grandkids coming with, or I might have my brother and his wife coming with. So it's very much a family-oriented uh, 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 search, okay? We have the collective mindset, we have the family mindset, and we're also looking for space, okay? We like big yards. We want big yards. Some, some of it has to do with who we're going to be bringing over to entertain, right? Because we got car parking spots now. Who are we going to bring over to entertain? But also because we tend to be entrepreneurial. We tend to own our own businesses. And a lot of our businesses are in the service industry, are in the construction industry. So we need a place to park our work truck. We need a place to park our construction trailer. Okay, so having that space is important. And then finally, language. Now, this is, a, this is an area that has been adjusting quite a bit here in the last couple, 20, couple decades, so the last 20 years. It used to be that if you wanted to reach the Latino community, you did it all in Spanish, right? Dr. Jake Beneflaw has some research that came out that is showing that 80 per, up to upwards of 80% of Spanish uh, only television is not even hitting the millennial. The millennial, the Latino millennial, is the one who's mortgage ready, right? I'm not saying, oh, and then the other thing too is when, they, when NAREP did that study and talked to their 620 top producing agents, in 2020 they saw a 13% drop in la Spanish language prevalence, meaning that they didn't necessarily need to have everything done in Spanish. And it's very evident here, um, one, of, one of the uh, founding presidents of NAREP, the local chapter, Guille Garza, she's actually one of the top 100 agents in the Midwest. As well as yourself. As well as myself. I made the list. Um, 10 years ago, when you, when you talk to her about her business, 10 years ago, her business, she said that was conducted 99.9% .9 in Spanish. Fast forward to today, it's somewhere in that 30 to 35 percent. Okay, so there's a change going on in language. I'm not saying not to market in Spanish. I'm just saying be conscious of who it is that you want to market to because your message might be missed. Okay. There's a, f a couple other things uh, um, I want to touch base on before I wrap it up, but let's see here. I think that was pretty much it. I just want to make sure that you understand how important the digital marketing and why it's so important especially as a real estate agent, 
because it's a solo agent or even a small group with digital marketing within the social media world, within using that delivery system of your phone, you can be nimble, okay? You can dive in. If you wanna find out and target the Peruvian community here in the Twin Cities, you can do that using Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and dive into that. And you can make decisions a lot faster than some of the, the larger corporations who have a huge delivery uh, decision-making process. So that's an advantage. Make sure you take advantage of that asset of being small and nimble and move around quickly. Um, thank you very much.